Bike lanes across North America are atrocious. Streets and roads often have a solid line on the right-hand side that is meant to guide drivers as they stay within their lane. If the space between the line and the gutter is wide enough, the city may enhance the space with a guy on the bike stencil, or something similar, to indicate that it's not just a gutter, whereas a painted bike gutter. This is the reason that not just bikes and others like him have coined the phrase painted bike gutter to describe these bike lanes. It emphasizes just how little care there is for making bike riding a viable form of transportation. Paint is not infrastructure, and slapping a stencil onto the ground should never be used as a substitute for proper bike paths, because this design pattern is only uncomfortable and outright dangerous. People on bikes are riding alongside vehicles that emit a lot of air and noise pollution, so anyone who is on a bike lane or a sidewalk is breathing in the exhaust fumes while listening to the never-ending sounds of tires rolling on asphalt. The surrounding pollution makes the area an unpleasant place to ride through, and the lack of physical separation puts cyclists at a much greater risk of being struck by a motorist. A study from Monash University has shown that close calls between passing vehicles and cyclists are frequent. The study recorded over 18,500 passing events from 422 trips. Almost one in every 17 passing events came within one meter or three feet of the traveling cyclist. Alarmingly, 124 passing events came within less than 60 centimeters or less than two feet. In higher speed zones, greater than 60 kilometers an hour or 40 miles per hour, almost one in every three passing events was a close pass of less than five feet. It is stressful riding along the bike lane and seeing a Ford F-150 over your shoulder, especially if you are in Texas and they start passing at a distance that is too close for comfort. The resulting collision between a cyclist and a vehicle on a 30 mile per hour road could be fatal. A strip of white paint is not protecting people in any scenario. If anything, it is a suggestion to drivers, but not a requirement to stay within the lane. A physical barrier would actually prevent drivers from intruding upon the space that is reserved for bikes. On slower roads, it is not unusual to find bike lanes that are running between moving cars and parked cars. Without a buffer between the parked cars and the bike lane, there is risk of someone fleeing their door open and injuring a cyclist. Some locations opt to use a Shero instead, so people on bikes can use the entire lane to distance themselves from parked cars. Studies have shown that this design pattern gives inexperienced riders a false sense of security, which actually increases the risk compared to not having any paint or signage whatsoever. Even when there are cars not making this environment hostile, painted bike gutters are confusing since there is no contiguous path to follow. Much like sidewalks, bike gutters can begin and end for no apparent reason. If someone cannot see the stencil that indicates a bike lane, there is no way to know if it is a painted bike gutter or a regular gutter. While filming, I found this especially weird one. This is a three-way intersection. There is nothing forward from here, yet the bike lane indicates that people on bikes go straight. Why not have a straight arrow on the turn lanes while you're at it? At an intersection, bike lanes are designed in a way where making a turn is unclear. There are no markings to show the intended route for cyclists. How does someone turn left? Should they stop at the crosswalk and cross like a pedestrian, or casually merge across several lanes of traffic and turn like a car would? The safer option seems to be to do the former. Similarly, how should someone turn right? The logical solution seems to be to just follow the curb into the next bike lane, but that is not always possible. Not every road has a painted bike gutter to follow, and roads that have a dedicated turn lane places the bike lane somewhere that adds an extra point of conflict between bikes and cars. If a road has a dedicated turn lane, the bike lane is placed to the left of the turn lane. This is done to reduce the chance of a right hook collision. When a driver is making a right turn, they tend to pay more attention to oncoming traffic, diverting any attention from pedestrians on the right and cyclists over their shoulder. The driver may not see people they should be looking out for, make a right turn when it's not safe, and strike the cyclist. The resulting collision is known to cause head trauma, broken bones, and even death. 
Placing the bike lane to the left of the turn lane removes the conflict when traveling straight, but it creates a new point of conflict for when the turn lane intersects the bike lane. This makes it more difficult to continue going straight because bikes have to weave through cars that are merging right into the turn lane. It also becomes more difficult to execute a right turn since bike traffic and car traffic is being mixed onto the same lane. Painted bike gutters are incoherent when cars are not around, and they are dangerous when cars are around. Having to maintain speed with surrounding traffic and weave through vehicles when nearing turn lanes and intersections is stressful, and the only people who can really endure these conditions are vehicular cyclists. Vehicular cycling is where people ride their bikes on roadways in accordance to the same laws and practices as if they were actually driving a car. Only a small percentage of people are willing to participate in this risky behavior, so others who would use their bikes for transportation more often are unwilling or unable to do so out of a reasonable fear of being struck by a motorist. A vehicular cyclist may be comfortable with taking the lane, weaving between cars, and making a bunch of other rapid-fire decisions, but riding a bike for transportation should be an activity that anyone can enjoy. Nobody should be expected to put their lives at a greater risk because they chose to ride a bike around town instead of a car. Cars and bikes are very different kinds of vehicles. Cars are big machines with blind spots and they can accelerate very quickly. Bikes, on the other hand, do not require much more space than the people riding them. There are no blind spots, and they move at a slow, constant speed. They should not share the same infrastructure and road rules as cars do. In order to keep people safe, bikes need their own separated paths, and when they have to share space, there must be traffic calming measures that signals to drivers that they need to carefully observe their surroundings and move slowly. More people would be willing to ride their bikes on bike lanes if there was proper bike infrastructure that protects even its most vulnerable of road users so it can be comfortably used by everyone. It is important to note that the reason bike lanes are allowed to be built like this, despite the design flaws, is because of engineering standards, regardless of whether or not they are actually good. In the United States, cities may typically follow the national standards set by the American Association of State, Highway, and Transportation Officials Guide for the Development of Bicycle Facilities. So, if studies show that placing cyclists into these conditions increases the risk of a near-miss or collision, then that will be used anyway because the guide says so. The bike lanes that I have been filming are located in Reno, Nevada. The Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan that was adopted in 2017 has compiled crash data statistics from the previous year to identify the driver conditions during a collision. This crash data is disturbing because if a majority of collisions occur under apparently normal driver conditions, then that should be a strong indicator that the problem lies elsewhere. Humans are imperfect beings. While it would be nice for people to behave correctly under any circumstance, that is not going to happen. Since collisions can still occur under apparently normal driver conditions, then the infrastructure should reinforce good driving and cycling habits. It especially should not throw people on bikes and people in cars into a hodgepodge mess that increases the risk of an injury or fatality. There has been good progress in cities dotted all across the country. However, national standards are still failing to make bike riding a viable alternative for people who feel unsafe when sharing the road with other vehicles. The book Cycling for Sustainable Cities has compiled data from various sources and found that while cycling fatalities have been declining since the 1990s, fatalities have increased by 13% in the United States between 2014 and 2018. The overall decline is also substantially less than in European countries and Canada. This indicates that while incremental progress has been made, bike riding is still substantially more dangerous than it is anywhere else. Furthermore, when comparing the fatality rates per 100 million kilometers cycled, the United States has a whopping 5.6 fatalities compared to 0.8 in the Netherlands. These trends should not be too surprising when considering that the Netherlands has far superior cycling infrastructure than the painted gutters found across North America. 
The most frustrating thing about the problems found in these painted bike gutters is that the problems have already been solved. There are more sensible solutions to bike infrastructure than slapping paint on a roadway. The YouTube channel Bicycle Dutch has fantastic videos that demonstrate the quality infrastructure that can be found in the Netherlands. The Dutch stopped building lanes like this a long time ago. They keep cyclists to the right of motorized traffic and deal with the crossing on the junction itself. This design solves a further problem, that of the left turn. The design guide used in the Netherlands is the Crow Design Manual for Bicycle Traffic, and it is currently the de facto standard for handling bike infrastructure, and it is available in English. There is nothing secretive about the right way to design a bike lane. Civil engineers could update their local design standards to the known solutions that improve safety and increase bike ridership. When new standards are adopted, the city can begin the process of updating roads when they need to be revised, such as in a road diet, or when they need to be resurfaced. When safety issues are properly addressed and there is infrastructure that protects even its most vulnerable of road users, then more people will feel invited to use these bike lanes. People actually do want to ride their bikes, just not on a painted gutter. A zero fatality future is achievable as long as we redesign the way our cities are built to better accommodate the different modes of transit. Nobody should have to put themselves at a greater risk just because they chose not to drive.